Down through the history of religion, there has been tremendous emphasis upon vigil. Vigil has always been part of man's spiritual quest for reality. And uh, it seems to be based, at least in part, on the biblical statement, Be still and know that I am God. The ancient people depended almost entirely upon internal mystical experiences for their concepts of reality. Much the same were the people of the Southwest American Indian tribes and nations. Vigil was a very common Indian practice. In fact, it was indispensable to the maturity of the growing child. He had to seek always from within himself for those strengths that were to support him uh, through the rest of his life. I think one point that we have to realize is that antiquity did not have the privileges and the protections that we know. And uh, as a result, the child could not depend upon the strength of his community. He could not depend upon the consistency and survival of his tribe. He could depend only upon inward strength. And this quest always was to strengthen the internal life of the individual. Now, as we look at contemporary situations, we find more or less a repetition of the old situation. Today we are learning that it is not possible to depend entirely upon our social protections. We realize that we are not in a secure position, even though we may have done everything that has been required of us by the culture to which we belong. We must have personal strength, and this is what is generally lacking today throughout the world. We are depending upon something else to do our thinking for us, to do our protecting for us, to bring us happiness, wealth, all these things, all depends upon what some other people do. In the older world, everyone had to do for himself. And to do this successfully, he had to have courage. And where was he going to find courage? He could not find it in anything except his religion. Courage was impossible to the ancient person without some foundation in faith or integrities that were of a spiritual or at least philosophical foundation. Also in those older times, when, we got, when man got into difficulties, there was no one to get him out but himself. Everything depended upon his own ability to survive. He must find his way through the inconsistencies and inconstancies of peace and war, of plenty and famine, of plagues and earthquakes. There was nothing that he could do to save or correct and condition himself except inward strength. So today we remember the old idea of vigil. One of the classic examples of vigil is a painting of a young knight in armor, kneeling in, the, in front of the altar of his cathedral, holding up the cross of form symbol of the hilted sword, and also praying. Before you could be consecrated as a knight in the age of chivalry, he had to do vigil. He had to remain alone in the church from dark to dawn, occupied with nothing but the contemplation of his place in a divine plan. This was his only hope. He had to have strength to bear the responsibilities of chivalry. He had to be dedicated to principles above selfishness. He had to have courage, not only of the body, but of the mind. And the only way was vigil. Among the American Indians also of the Plain Country, the vigil was man's introduction to the universal religious mystery of life. The young Indian performed vigil. And in the vigil, the visions came. 
by which his life was directed and conditioned and, and led in the way that it was supposed to go. Older Indians with problems and troubles also needed the refreshment of divine association. They went out at night to some quiet place far from the hearse, uh, the hurry and bury of even tribal life. They placed the four playup rooms at the corners of the world, then sat down and smoked the calumet, the sacred peace pipe, which was the smoking altar of the Indian religion. Then, quietly, the Indian sat back, closed his eyes, but did not lie down. He had to sit up all night for his vigil and simply added the few words of prayer, Father, show me the way. This was the direct contact. This was the religious ritual of many of the tribes of American Indian peoples. They had a firm belief that they lived in a world of life, that they were surrounded constantly not by emptiness, but by a strange divine habitation of all kinds of creatures and beings, some dangerous, some benevolent. But in vigil at night, the problem was a little more difficult than in the daytime. Out there in the, somewhere in the desert or in the plain, there was no silence in the night. The animals of nocturnal habits came out. Strange sounds were heard, howls, light shone upon the eyes of animals in the distance. Everywhere there was rustling and turning and twisting, and the Indian had to remain completely integrated against the strangeness of darkness, which was the Indian symbol of ignorance. Everything that is ignorance lives in the dark, and the dark is full of sounds of hazards, of mysteries, and of wonders, and of fears. And it is only the courage of the inner self that can help the thoughtful person to live in a world of ignorance and still keep his faith, keep his beliefs, keep his wisdom, keep his religion. We know in the Bible that the prophets went out into the wilderness to fast and to pray. We know that all the way through Eastern and Western religions, what we call now meditation was very important. Meditation was silence, a silence within the self that was not weakness, a silence that was not emptiness, a silence which was a strange peace rooted in the realization of the utter security of integrity that that which was right had nothing to fear, and that which was wrong had little to hope for. So all these silent communes between the person and something within himself, these were the most important of all circumstances. Now when uh, the modern religionist prays, even uh, in the small vigil, of a few moments. He prays to God or to what he considers one of the messengers or avatars or saints of deity. And he is reasonably expectant that that prayer will be answered. Now, what is the basis of his certainties in this matter? In the course of the day, hundreds of millions of prayers go up from every part of the earth. Is there somewhere, anywhere, a God that can hear them all? Is there any God anywhere that can meet all the needs that these supplicants feel is necessary to their survival? The uh, atheist says, no, it's impossible. The uh, normal theist simply regard deity as an omniscient ear that can hear all and will sit quietly with that conviction. But the mystic, who has understood a little better and a little deeper, has a different conclusion. 
Of course God hears the prayer. Because it is the God in you that is the hope of glory. The divinity in each of us is a power that we reach through vigil. It is an ever-present deity, not out in space listening, but in our own hearts and minds, omnipotent and omnipresent. Therefore, when we say, Lord, listen, it is the God in us that is the hope of our salvation. Now, it's not difficult to understand why ancient people believed this. They believed it because they found that the prayers were answered. They had constant testimony that when their desire was right and good and proper and sincerely presented, there was a good probability that it would be answered. It would be answered because of the power, the tremendous reservoir of divine energy that is locked within each living creature, from the smallest to the greatest. Everything has its root in deity. And it is this eternal root, diffused everywhere, that experiences uh, the possibility of divine intercession. So in the olden days, there was no question about who was going to answer prayer. And sometimes the individual was disappointed. The prayer was not answered. And the need that he felt so deeply was not fulfilled. Probably this caused him to have some doubts and might even change his religion. But it was not the fact involved. The reason it wasn't answered was because there was some reason in the person by which it could not be answered. There was something wrong in the person who made the prayer. Therefore, it was not believed in most cases that vigil was something in which you suddenly leave behind a world of doubts and misgivings and in a few seconds achieve union with the divine. Vigil was something that the individual had to uh, prepare for. A vigil was something that the child grew up with, always seeking, always determining that the best part of himself should always be approached with spiritual integrity. Therefore, in vigil, as it was then anciently practiced, there were certain preparatory rites. One was purification, symbolized by means of the water of benediction or of christening. This purification was the preparation of the person to receive his own higher part in communion with himself. He was preparing the house that the Lord might dwell therein. Not that the God did not already dwell there, but between the divine power and daily life was a mass of complicated interferences selfishness, self-interest, anger, hatred, disillusionments of all kinds, corruptions of conscience and of ethics. All of these things locked the individual away from the dweller in the innermost. It was necessary, therefore, that those who would approach this divine presence should be properly and duly prepared and it was only in those moments of proper preparation that the fulfillment was made possible. So if the person asked for a divine favor and disliked his neighbor, he might not get it. If he wanted the strength to make a constructive decision, but lacked the morality in himself to make that decision, it might not be that he would have that support in those moments. He had to be worthy. The knight had to be worthy before the altar of his church. Everywhere the approach to the divine must be based upon worthiness. And ways of achieving worldliness and worthiness are very interesting. 
All you have to do to be worldly is to drift along doing what you please. But if you wish to be worthy, then you must follow a very strict code of activity and conduct. Now, this code is not, however, a punishment. It is not an endless frustration of every natural human attitude and belief. It is not something that deprives us of the joys of life. The code, as it was known to the ancients, opened the gates of joy. The individual found that as he improved himself, his troubles slowly grew less that as soon as he was able to overcome the selfishness in himself, he was then perhaps entitled to wealth or position. Whatever he did with that was right in his home, in his business, in his world, made living easier, but it required decision. He had to decide whether he wished to destroy his own place in the plan or by staying in that place have a greater and more glorious fulfillment. So in the problem we find in Eastern peoples also meditative disciplines, as we find in Zen, or as we find in the Sufis, or these different religious peoples. Always the highest achievement is the reward of being able to go into a mood or state of detachment from self-interest. As long as we think of ourselves first and cater to ourselves first, we will understand the meaning of the words, and the first shall be last, because the basic principle is wrong. So as we go into the problem of vigil, we find, as uh, Swami Vivekananda said on one occasion, that these disciplines are not things that really that you settle down to for a few minutes a day. These disciplines become the natural life way. The individual is performing his meditation constantly. He is not thinking of meditation. He is doing all kinds of other preoccupied, uh, preoccupied jobs and labors. He is in business, in home. Whatever he is doing, however, he lives in a continuous state of vigil because he is vigilant over himself. He is watchful to see that temptations are properly resisted and that in the presence of many opportunities to compromise principles, he remains true to the realities. Now, the reward of this is not simply that he has a little better time in his family or is a better citizen or a better parent or a better child. The real reward is that he is gradually changing the polarity of his life, that he is gradually gaining the capacity to retire into the depths of the innermost in himself. In England and Germany during the 17th and early 18th centuries, there were a great many mystical movements, movements that were very largely uh, devoted to a non sectarian, non-theological experience of the presence of God. These mystical movements such as the Pietists and the Quakers and others, Mennonites, these uh, sects believed simply in living a vigil. They believed that every moment should be lived within a pattern of dedications that the person who prays, prays most while he labors, and that the person who has no use for work has no religion, no matter what he may claim. Religion is service. It is the fulfillment of need. It is the taking care of the personal responsibilities. It is the individual defending his right to work, but not his work, not to his right to delay his labor. He is supposed to be constantly doing that which is next, proper, reasonable, and purposeful. Now, in this particular type of thinking, we know that the person trying to go more deeply into self finds one of the most common hindrances is lack of emotional control. 
he feels very good about loving his neighbor until he meets his neighbor, and then he has difficulties. He is perfectly certain that he has a good job until someone talks him into dissatisfaction. He thinks he has a happy home until he discovers that his own willfulness is in danger of breaking it. All the way along, the individual's emotions taking over uh, get him into difficulty. Now, it isn't the motion taking over that has done this, but it is emotion undisciplined, untrained, and unregenerate that has done the mischief. Emotions are something very beautiful, and the more beautifully they are appreciated and applied, the richer life becomes. But the emotion of affection can also be turned in ignorance into the emotion of hate. So the mystic seeking to refine and purify his own nature realized, as Birmi, the German mystic, realized, that all these destructive emotions disturb the relation of the individual to his own true self. Between the self as a divine being and the self as we find it in daily contact with people, the difference between these two is the difference between an internal, etern eternal, and an external temporal or temporal situation that do not reconcile. So actually, the problem of emotional control is best at solved by quietude. It certainly isn't solved by watching television. It isn't served or sold or thought through rock music. It doesn't come to us as the result of the tremendous pressures of excitement, of uh, competition, and of the constant determination to do what we want to do at all costs. But in this particular area, if we look around, we will see the tremendous penalty of lack of emotional control. If this control weakens too much, we have a psychotic condition. And it makes excesses of emotion can lead to a hopeless mental sickness. No one really got terribly sick because they were kind. But they can get terribly sick if they are unkind. All around us in life are laws and rules. The American Indian believed this and was quite certain that these laws and rules were actually in the air around him all the time. All he had to do in order to achieve the peace of soul that he was seeking was to be quiet and let reality move in upon him. Let the sky speak to him. Let the earth be kind to him. Let all the creatures around share with him the energies and resources of life. And in vigil, there was this control of pressure. There was the individual sit, sitting quietly receptive to the divine will. Now, this is another point here, however, that is very uh, important and is often comes up in connection with psychic experiences. Quietude is not negative. Quietude is not the individual opening the door to unknown visitors or the first burglar who wants to come in. Quietude is not negation. It is not a statement of helplessness. It is rather a statement of actual integration. Quietude cannot even be achieved by a person without discipline. If you don't think this is true, try it sometime. Try sitting down for ten minutes without any conscious mental attitude, but living simply in the experience of peace a very peaceful experience. Within two or three minutes, the mind will start to wander. We haven't any way of centering the mind subjectively, only objectively. So this thought of loving everyone may gradually lead into the realization that we are not very fond of several people. And as soon as this comes, the meditation is finished. It is no longer possible 
the mind finds it almost impossible to prevent the intrusion of the objective. And the objectives are usually objections. It is very difficult for a person to be quiet except when he's asleep. If he becomes unconscious, he may still dream, but he doesn't remember it. But to be awake and quiet for any length of time can result in extreme nervousness, boredom, or an almost fantastic uh, danger which seems to move in unless we once more make our connection with the external. The great Japanese psychologist, Morita, uh, worked out a system for people who were naturally inclined to be neurotic. He pointed out that one of the first things the individual has to do is learn to live happily with himself. And nearly all people who are troubled have, are sorry for themselves, basically. Uh, they feel that they have been abused. They have been injured. They have been frustrated. So they keep on building this pattern until finally it comes into a dangerous antisocial attitude. Morita began, therefore, by taking a person who was neurotic or inclined to be and was bringing all kinds of dismal stories to the attention of his physician or practitioner. The first thing Morita made these people do was to go into a room without a book, without a word, without a friend, and simply be there by themselves with nothing to do whatever, not even a piece of string they could tie knots in, and stay that way until they finally had a talk with themselves. That was pretty rough. It sounds as though it would be very, very easy. Many people say, if I could only be alone for a little while, I would be in heaven. But no one who is not self-disciplined can be alone and be happy. All this escape from confusion is due to a desperate effort to depart from the presence of self. Now, in self, I do not mean, as a psychologist would put it, merely a mental entity. I mean in self, the, e the deep, real, spiritual basis of, a, of our existence, the divine in us, the universal self that manifests through our personal self. The more universal we become, the more universal our divine self can manifest. But as long as we are locked in our attitudes, better attitudes simply cannot enter. The only time the individual with a bad uh, uh, adaptation to society can get along a little better is when a great disaster forces him to face himself for a short time. Then he forgets these little personal matters but as soon as the danger passes, he drops back into himself again. In this case, into the self that is not real. So in uh, Morita's therapy, vigil, called just simply playing, getting uh, to know yourself a little better, was the beginning of therapy. And the beginning of therapy in this case was to face self and live with it for three or four days and find what a monster it was. This little self, this mind self, this ego, with all its dependencies. And not far from Dr. Morita's establishment was a hospital built in Japan for the improvement of those with various degrees of actual mental ailments. This hospital was built by public funds and was located very beautifully in a very fine stretch of countryside. It was a very handsome institution to take care of the sick. The director of the institution decided that, this, that there was a form of therapy that hadn't been tried in his country, and that he would try it. He brought together a group of people, practically all of the inmates of this institution. Some hadn't spoken for years. Some cried all the time. Some hated each other. It was a group of sick people. So he took a beautiful piece of paper or a large area of wall or something of that nature, and he drew on it a pattern for the gardens of this institution. 
and he enlisted them all, assuming in his enlistment that they were all perfectly normal, that it was their opportunity and almost their responsibility to the emperor, most of all, that they do the gardening. They should design the garden. They should ask for the materials they needed. They should get together and discuss it. And when it was gradually developed, they should take care of it. And it was a, pr a problem and a job that would probably last a year or two. Before the end of the year, 60% of the inmates were dismissed as cured. Going out and doing it. Going out close to life with the natural sensitivity that these people have to beauty. Re restored most of them. And in the remaining 40%, there was marked improvement. There was not a case in which there was not improvement. So this shows the importance not only of getting away from this isolation, which can be institutional, or it can simply be an individual isolation because of conduct and attitude. To get back into the beauty of life, to discover the wonders of life, and to realize that in gardening you are using the children of God, the flowers, to accomplish a work which was to stand for the presence of the divine. It was all very nice, and it worked, because every individual who is able to improve his relationship with himself is better off and will come nearer to what he may regard as happiness. How to do this, then, was to, first of all, begin to practice some type of vigil. And uh, this can be, first of all, a simple vigilance, a comparative watchfulness over personal conduct. The individual can decide in his own mind, perhaps to keep a small diary of his own moods. He can also begin to think at the moment when he is irritated, whether the irritation is important enough to allow it to interfere with the presence of the divine within him. Can he hate people with sufficient value to himself if he realizes that as he hates people, he hates God? This is something that he has to think through. But it isn't so difficult at first. Children do very well with it. But the older people are afraid of the hole in the dark they are afraid of all kinds of things that have become superficially associated with their lives. So it might be a good idea to follow the general thought of Vivekananda, and that is to consider your daily life as meditation, your daily life as your great religious dedication. Instead of thinking of religion being when you go to church, let begin to think of religion, therefore, as when you go to work, when you go to the store, when you take the children to school. All of these things are just as religious as worship because they are all done for the glory of the reality locked in life itself, a reality which can be released only by conscious dedication. So vig uh, vigilance or carefulness becomes a basic vigil. It is something in which the person puts a God upon himself and determines that he will accomplish that which is best for his own good. Now, these things may seem trite to a great many people, but over the years you'd be surprised how many people have come to me with problems that they cannot forget the injustices they have suffered. They cannot forgive the relative who cheated them. They cannot forgive the businessman who shortchanged them. They cannot believe the woman who took away their husbands, or something of this nature. Everything is locked in pain. Then they get a medical diagnosis and are told they are really very sick, and this does the final work. Everything becomes hopeless. These people are a step from physical suicide, but they have already committed mental suicide by their attitude towards life. So for these people, there simply is no way out except by changing their own attitude. Now it may be hard, maybe, to put a good attitude on top of a bad one and expect it to stick. It probably won't stick. 
But uh, the vigil technique is different. Instead of building a good attitude on a bad one, vigil means simply to not have an attitude. Not allow positive or negative to take over. But that where previously there was a conflict, the answer is a condition of quietude. It, quietude doesn't necessarily mean you've forgiven your enemy or that you've made a friend out of him. Quietude means that for the moment the whole situation is suspended, that there is no longer any emphasis. Nothing is feeding an attitude, especially a bad one. Without feeding attitudes, they starve to death just like any other part of life. And by not giving support of uh, added emphasis to some ancient tragedy, you gradually uh, get over it. Now, we all realize that in the memory processes, uh, large and important incidents are remembered the longest. And people of older years who forgot, have forgotten the names of their own children still remember the unhappiness that happened to them when they were young. This type of memory is spotty, but the emphasis is upon critical situations in most cases. If the memory fails, of course, the individual forgets all his troubles. But the problem is how to keep the memory in good condition and still live with the problems and not let them take over. The one way that the ancients decided was that each person should finally come to realize that he was strangely an individual. He was a person, not a puppet that was having the strings pulled by something else. He was himself. Therefore, he was capable of building a life of his own. And the fact that thousands of people around him were living badly had no basic value for him. He had the right to do as he saw fit or believed. And if doing what he believed was not getting anywhere, then there was probably something wrong with his believing. So this has to be checked out. As long as we can believe that we can avenge ourselves, we will try. But when it gradually dawns upon us that what we call revenge is nothing but making ourselves sick, then it is not so hard to change. We always can remember that the person we dislike is not even aware that we are disliking them, or if they are aware, simply do not care. So the problem of getting ourselves out of the tangle is the thing that has to be considered. In the, in the Eastern nations, particularly, children are, learned from, are taught from very early life uh, to have certain religious attitudes. They are taught that when trouble hits them or difficulties arise, be quiet. Be very quiet, but not negative. If the moment the individual is negative and allows all kinds of psychic phenomena to move in upon him, he may be in another difficulty, because most psychic phenomena in some way is symbolical of self-interest something we want, something we do not want. It is self-pity, it is ambition, it is arrogance. It has nothing to do with the reality. Our dreams are highly psychotic. And very often our so-called waking dreams or mystical experiences are simply further evidence of our troubles, but not a solution to them. We are always looking for something to solve these problems. We are looking for a teacher who can take them all away from us. We are looking for a religion that will forgive them all. Uh, we are looking for a way of life in which we can make our mistakes without interfering with joy, peace, or happiness. This does not exist, and there can never be an achievement of it. The only way we can get over the pressures that make us unhappy is by reducing the pressure. In reducing the pressure we have to find some way of getting over another tendency we have, and that is to defend the pressure in ourselves. When things get a little unhappy, what do we do? We turn on the TV, and so we get ourselves off our minds. As soon as we turn it on, we get something else on our minds that's worse. But we feel very content about it, 
because for a couple of hours we did not remember that we disliked someone. This was relief, release. As soon as we turned off the station, the problems came back. But these considered them to be interludes in which we could get our worries off of our minds. This is a, completely fall is a complete fallacy because these worries are not just simply clouds floating in the sky of our mind. These problems are simply the climate of the entire mental life, and we cannot escape it that way. Also, we also find all kinds of unimportant outlets which we seek to use to keep our minds off ourselves. Now, we can all have hobbies. Hobbies are wonderful things. They can do a great deal to help us. But well, the purpose of a hobby is not to make us forget our mistakes. The, the, the proper use of a hobby is to exercise the mind in a constructive or useful or pleasant way. But hobbies do not cure the basic ignorances from which we suffer. It's only after we get over the ignorance that we can really enjoy the hobby. Because enjoyment in its full sense in all cases depends upon the correction of internal attitudes. Now, there have been all kinds of systems set up. And, uh, some individuals uh, try to find relief through religion. They, they join an organization, or as they used to do in the old days, they go through a riverside baptism, and they're saved. But the minister always tells those who know that he has to come back again next year and save the same person again. The salvation seldom lasts over a year. The individual, moved by common impulse, surrounded by friends who are pushing them forward, and, and part of a peer group that has been baptized, feels that he has achieved something, and it helps a little. He may drink a little less. He may be a little less annoying to other people. But in about a year, the old habits come back, and he has to start over again. Now, this is the way it is with most efforts to correct this type of condition. You cannot correct it from the outside. You cannot get anything into you through education or philosophy or ethics or anything that can definitely substitute for your own inner insight. After you get the insight, your philosophies become very valuable. After you know where you're going, the road map is important. But while you are still locked within the internal conflicts, no amount of external change can really correct the situation. You move out of a difficulty, but you take yourself with you, and the difficulty moves along. So we get the, this problem now of the quietude. Let's see how we're going to do this, or how it might be worked out in a quite pleasant way. Well, maybe the first thing to do is to simply... Sit down once a day and just relax. Just relax away from everything. Don't try to think of something nice. Don't try to think of something that isn't nice. Don't try to wiggle and twist and twitch until you get yourself all nervous again. Just sit down for a few moments and experience the peace and quietude of a universe that extends on and on to infinite durations, but is aware of the need of every living thing. So we get the, this problem now of the quietude. Let's see how we're going to do this, or how it might be worked out in a temp quite pleasant way. Well, maybe the first thing to do is to simply sit down once a day and just relax. Just relax away from everything. Don't try to think of something nice. Don't try to think of something that isn't nice. Don't try to wiggle and twist and twitch until you get yourself all nervous again. Just sit down for a few moments and experience the peace and quietude of a universe that extends on and on to infinite durations, but is aware of the need of every living thing.
aware because within each living thing is that same power that moves the stars. After all, in this case, the cosmos and the human heart are very close relatives. In fact, one is simply the extension of the other. So in quietude and with a sense of peace, try to simply contemplate the reality of life as a kind of quiet security, a something that can always be reached, that whenever you are still and quiet and at peace with life, the inside will tell you which way to go. Therefore, you have a right to ask as the Indians ask, show me the way. But in that doing, do not try to tell this voice that you hope for the answer you demand. In other words, do not ask to be shown the way and then insist on going your own way as you always have. If you do, nothing happens. Except you will blame the infinite for failing you, when in reality you are the one who has misjudged the situation. Little by little you will find it possible to smooth out the common occurrences of life. You will find that it's no more difficult uh, to live pleasantly with a family than it is to live unpleasantly with them. Now, if the rest of the family is so objectionable that you cannot live pleasantly with them, you always have the realization that in our modern life, changes can be made. But not until every possible means has been used to prove to you that you are not to blame for the situation, that you are not the one who irritates someone else, antagonizes them, or tries to dominate them, or over, is over-extravagant in your relations with them. These things each person has to solve for himself. If at the end of a careful resolution and careful solution you still find the problem unreasonable, then you always can take whatever steps you feel desirable. But these steps should also be made in peace, in love, in kindness, and in friendship. Nothing else works. Now, we know in the world of affairs that we are afraid of this and we're afraid of that. But most of the shadows that we fear most are phantoms, and these shadows are self-devouring. The, sh the negative shadow eats itself up finally and disappears. But always... Uh, a little special leadership is required to keep our own minds and hearts correct. We have to develop a certain amount of discretion also. We have to decide the best we can what is of first importance, what is the thing most necessary at any given moment. And we must try to do this with complete quietude. And we will find that this quiet way begins to affect decisions. Our decisions are more thoughtfully made. We do not have to rush into a situation. We can contemplate it, we can consider it, we can review it, and we can ask simply, is this the way that I should go? Gradually, these quiet ways of approaching problems can become habitual. The individual who once rushed to decisions and regretted them at leisure now has the possibility of being slower benefiting from his own previous experiences and gaining a new depth of insight and a new understanding of how to handle aggravations. By doing this, he is gradually developing vigil. He is gradually increasing the peace in himself. And the more peace there is on, in his own nature, the more certainly he can respond to the divine realities of his own divine part. It is all a matter of releasing the better, which we keep in prison by glorifying the worst. If we can get over this, if we can make sure that everything that comes out from our inner life is acceptable in the sight of the Lord, if we realize that we are gradually opening the door that leads into a mystical experience. Now, in the ancient times, and also among primitive peoples, a mystical experience has been closely related to vigil. 
It usually occurs in one of three situations. Either in vigil, vigil, which may be prayer or meditation. The second possible source is the tremendous uh, power of labor. We may find our mystical experience in our work, if our work is actually enlightened. The uh, service of others can lead to an internal spiritual release of energy. The third possible source of the mystical experience is in the presence of the disabled or the infirm, the presence of a crisis, a critical situation in which for a moment at least we forget ourselves in the service of something else that is greater than ourselves. Like the man or woman who cannot swim, who jumps into the river to save the child who is drowning. Perhaps the child is saved and the person who tried to save it is drowned. But this is, from the spiritual standpoint of things, a tremendously vital circumstance in an eternal life existence in which all incidents are comparatively temporary. So actually, the forgetting of self is important to the release of God through the human nature. Until we forget ourselves, we can never think of anything more important than ourselves. And the complete uh, problem of vigil is to make this as quiet and peaceful as possible. An old Indian priest, medicine priest, sitting with his, pl uh, his prayer plumes and his peace pipe, is asking divine guidance. He is admitting by the very asking that he is not adequate with him by himself. Of himself he can do nothing. It is the Father in him who doeth the works. So quietly he asks for insight. He asks for understanding. He asks for wisdom. Or the young Indian going out into the forest, maybe in meditation or in vigil, asking for his totem the creature that is to become his spiritual protection throughout life, as in the, much like the daemon of Socrates, a spirit guide which was believed in by the Egyptians, by the Greeks, by the Hindus and the Chinese, that there is something that goes with us as a spiritual guide. And this something that goes with us is another name for our own soul, a soul which does the works of the Father if we permit it. The human soul is an ever-present protection against the limitations and misunderstandings of the human mind. And so in this way, the Indian priest goes out to ask to know. And one time, he has a sick person. And this sick person is very, very sick, and he asks the great spirit, the Manido, to give him the key to healing for that person. And as he sits quietly in meditation, in a kind of a half-dreaming state, he sees lights all around him on the ground, lights that he never sees if he looks for them, but lights when, when he is quiet look for him. And among the lights he sees a little flame, and it is around a little plant in the ground, and he knows instantly that the great ones have told him that this is the plant from which the healing medicine must be made for this particular sufferer. And by degrees he gains a pharmacology in this way. Here the Indian physician, who has never been to school, who has never actually been taught by any other Indian physician, who has never been given instructions by a previous uh, priest of the tribe, goes out and becomes a doctor by simple vigil. The vigil that brings back to him the universal knowledge of mankind, a knowledge that has always existed and is available to every individual who can get over the hypnotic attraction of his own ignorance. This is a very important thing. And so the old Indian goes back and he makes a tea out of the old root that he found and gives it to the patient and the patient is better. Then, in another case, it is a matter of social problem. You must go out and ask what to do, 
with the wayward child. And the spirits have to tell him what to do. And he has to do what the spirits tell him. And he will generally succeed in bringing the child back to the tribe as a useful citizen. All this is done in silence. It is done in a, a continuous condition of hopefulness, a condition of expectation that somewhere there is an answer to any question that the human being can ask. And that somewhere is somewhere in the depth of himself. To so get rid of this surface is to begin to live the power within. In other words, it might be called the second coming. For the first coming was when it gave us life. The second coming is when it was released to give others life through us. And in, in vigil and those types of things, in fasting and in meditation... There are battles fought, fought between self and self-interest, uh, uh, battles fought as Christ fought them, when he told the evil spirit to get them behind him, and did all the various temptations and emerged victorious. Now, instruction as we get it mentally won't do this, but mystical instruction has always been very prevalent. Every religion has developed within itself mystical schools which were suitable to give inspiration and courage to the members. These schools simply have no creeds. They live within the boundaries of the major religion in itself. Therefore, the mystical sects of Buddhism exist within the structure of Buddhist philosophy. The mystic sects of Hinduism are part of the Vedas and the great sacred books, the Puranas of the Hindu. The sacred books of, the, of Islam, the Quran, and the Masnavi are the books which give the dervish his insight and the Sufi his mystical experiences. And in Christianity, from the beginning, there have been mystical organizations, organizations that sought always for the substance and were never deceived by the surfaces of things. There were always some to whom a literal acceptance of a doctrine was not enough. They could join the order, they could become one with it, they could tie it to it, they could support it, and if necessary, they could even die to protect it, but they might never understand it. So it became very important to take literalisms and give them mystical interpretations. If people fail to do this, in the long run, they damage their own faith. For instance, in Christianity, we have now a major strife between Christianity as a religion and science and modernism and political atheism and all this type of thing. One of the great excuses or one of the great causes of this strife has been that they consider, or many consider, that the old theological doctrines are obsolete, that we can no longer fulfill them, we can no longer work with them, therefore we must get rid of them. Now, the thoughtful person looking for life knows this isn't true. He knows that the faith of the people of Christendom, this faith has guided, protected, and helped them for nearly 20 centuries. They know that millions of people have lived better lives and died with greater hope because of the faith of their fathers. We know there are many today who still hold exactly the literal teachings of 15 or 18 centuries ago. And we look upon these people as being a little too orthodox or a little too limited in their perspective. But now comes the eternal answer, the rise of mysticism. These people are, who are content with it as it is will stay that way. But those who have experienced the importance of religion are not going to give it up because it cannot be scientifically justified or that it cannot be part of an atheistic society. They have a something else. They realize through their own inner lives that the things that they have accepted literally also have metaphysical interpretations. 
they realize that it is not necessary to pre preserve the literalisms of things in order to become a member or stay a member of a religion. It is perfectly possible to be in good standing because inside we have found a better meaning, a larger interpretation, or a greater uh, insight into a faith that others accept on the surface only. Consequently, it is perfectly possible for the individual to live with people who are very literal in their theology and not find conflict because they have sought deeper for a better meaning. And that is what we would commonly know as a religious reformation. Every generation has to adjust religion to its own level of acceptances. But behind all these different levels, there is the one fact that doesn't change. Whether we understand it, believe it or not, and all improvement and growth in religion is toward the realization of the one eternal fact. And one of the examples of that is very simple, namely that we have many great religions in the world today, but the motion in all of them is in one direction, towards the ultimate reunion of all beliefs in the presence of the one great spiritual power that they all honor. This type of thing goes back again to the inner life of the person and saves any further difficulties or, or uh, estrangements due to theological differences. The vigil also has, is a, a great help physically with certain problems that arise. We are living in a very artificial society, a society that must change that changed from something else to get what it is now and must outgrow this and change to something else. Now, this contemporary social picture is short-lived, but it carries with it into defeat millions of human souls that cannot get out or cannot outgrow the particular concept that is prevalent today. Actually, we cannot... Uh, work with this type of uh, situation correctly unless we realize that all of these levels through which we pass and which are constantly unfolding around us, that all these levels are leading in one direction. They are leading to a mysterious reality that is the source of them all. All knowledge is one. There is no such a thing as a basic separation between biology and physics. Man has developed a separation, but they are all names for divisions and angles and aspects of the one tremendous reality which we are all seeking. Havelock Ellis pointed out in his, uh, one of his books that uh, when that one reality is found in meditation, there's no way of naming it. There's no way of actually describing it adequately. And that in its defense, truth cannot be adequately described. It can only be known by experience. It must occur, some degree of it, some level of it. The ultimate probably is not attainable to anyone at this time. But what we consider as a small step forward can change the history of the world. So the realities of things cannot be captured in words, but they can be known in the heart. And when they are known in the heart, all of these mysterious truths sum up to one enormous silence, a silence of perfect and complete safety, a silence that tells us beyond all words that we are in an eternal pattern fulfilling an eternal destiny that we can delay ourselves by our mistakes, but we cannot prevent the ultimate fulfillment of the divine plan in ourselves as well as in the universe. This type of thing helps. And gradually, if we go into a kind of vigil, we can quietly begin to think in terms of God as the fulfillment of all these doubts, that God, not as a person somewhere else, but as the fulfillment and the spiritual eternity of ourselves, 
All of the bodies we build will fade and go, but the builder of bodies remains eternal. We will find that all the answers that we think we have will sometime prove inadequate, but as that time comes, a greater adequacy will come to ourselves. We may doubt whether we can face the problems of the future. We can, because we always have faced them, and because the power within ourselves is stronger than any condition that can arise in human relationships. Also, this uh, power within, which Claude Bragdon refers to as the beautiful necessity, is in itself sublimity. It is something that takes away the power of doubt. It is something that is faith glorified and lifted up to a much higher level. This uh, sublimity is something that moves upon us. Bami describes it as, as simply a tremendous sense of fulfillment, an infinite sufficiency, something in which nothing is lacking, nothing that is needed can ever be absent. Nothing that is right can ever fail. There's a tremendous eternal ocean of fact, of reality, of truth, of, in, of eternal validity. And this, uh, this type of mystical experience has become to mystics and also to a great many of natural psychics a tremendous source of strength. It has become obvious that the little world we live in is passing, and the little body we live in is passing, but the great facts of life never change. The realities will continue until everything in the archetype of creation is fulfilled. And all things are not punishments, but invitations to growth. The things that we call difficulties are invitations to solution. The weaknesses of our own character are the invitations to the development of internal strength. Everything that happens is beckoning us on, but because it may interfere with some little purpose of the moment, we try to resist it. We try to resist anything that interferes with the miseries of the moment. We have become so accustomed to suffering that we regard it as a badge of honor. It is not. It is simply a symbol of the inability of the eternal power to come through to us. This is one of the problems that we are finding now in so-called holistic medicine, particularly in the field of healing. Healing, we have had all kinds of explanations for it. We have known that long before there were doctors, there was disease, and, and long before the doctors, some of people got well. They got well because essentially the priesthood of healing in ancient times was part of religion. Christ said to the woman, Thy faith has made thee whole. And there is something in each individual that can come to the rescue of sickness or debilities of one kind and another. Either they can be cured or they can be endured with dignity until the end of the particular pattern involved. But for the most part, they can be improved. And the ability to live with infirmities can be tremendously clarified and even glorified. It is all a matter of the individual's contact with the inner self. Vigil, therefore, in healing is the power of the individual to find peace of soul peace of mind, and peace of heart. And when these forms of peace are achieved, the body comes under a messianic dispensation. We know that the little cells in the body, in a strange way, are religious. They're not religious because they have a th th theology, but they are like the beasts of the fields and the birds of the air. They are religious because they live a doctrine live a real reality of truth, and they fulfill their own destiny with tremendous dignity and uh, un understanding, even though they seem so primitive. But these little parts of ourselves 
can be destroyed by the tyranny of our own ignorance. When these little parts of our bodies need love and thought and care and understanding and insight, and all we give them is a pill, something is missing. And that is why gradually Materia Medica is becoming involved in a hopeless dosage that does not result in any very permanent restoration of health. Actually, if the individual finds internal peace, it becomes like a revelation, like a spiritual dispensation to all the parts of the body, the organs, the nerves, the veins, all the parts of the body find a tremendous sense of recuperation if the personality is constructive and firm in its optimism and in its integrities. It then has also the courage and power to cooperate with the body in various ways, to assist it to restore its health and vitality. But the beginning is perhaps to realize in a quiet way, perhaps in a kind of vigil, that to this body in which we live, with its hundreds of millions of living things within it, we are God. We are God because we can control that body. We can be an evil demon if we pervert the rights and privileges of that body. We can save it or we can destroy it by an absolute autocracy of power. But autocracy of power is just as dangerous in ourselves as it is in society. What we need is a realization of a universal brotherhood with the atoms inside ourselves. We need to recognize our responsibility to those parts of life that are evolving within us and around us. And little by little, we can come to understand that it is possible for us to understand these atoms, even though it may not be possible for these atoms to understand us. We have the burden of responsibility. We are the guardians of the parts of ourselves, just as we are the guardians of our families and just as humanity becomes the guardian of humanity itself. So in our meditations and in our vigils, we are helping all the parts, and the reward is that we are healthier, that we are happier. And vigil as a religious experience is a cause of health, of happiness, of growth, of gratitude, and a strengthener of love and friendship. All these things, if strengthened together, certainly will make better living for us than anything we know at the present time. We are still struggling in a competitive society, but the universe in which we live is cooperative and will never rest until we understand that. We are struggling with competition in our own bodies due to the wrong way of administering rulership over the parts of ourselves. We try to uh, force growth. We try to overtax. We try to eliminate or evade or avoid the recreation and peace that are essential to the maintenance of the body. We are not kind to the body, and then we blame the body for being cruel to us. So in the, in the world of vigil, as we close off the outside, we enter into beauty. We enter into peace. We enter into all those wonders uh, which science still seeks in vain. We enter into a great universe that is one life, infinitely manifesting, and a one life, infinitely good, in all matters, mindful of the sparrow's fall, mindful of the smallest and the greatest, because this mindfulness is in each of these creatures itself. There is one divine power distributed and dis disseminated throughout all existence. And that power is known to some as wisdom and is known to some as God and it is known to some as love. It is all these things. It is the one basic source from which all life flows and it demands and requires that all life shall pay its homage. So with a little quietude and sort of thinking these kind of things through for a few minutes now and then, we can lay the foundations for a gradual growth of 
of constructive realizations in ourselves, we can gradually come to live more beautifully because we have found the true beauty to be internal and eternal. We can live to be more useful because we realize that the greatest use we can make of energy is to serve others because the energy we are using or abusing is the life of God. All these things gradually temper our attitudes and have tempered the attitudes of the mystics of all times. Behind these thoughts, we find the march of the sages, of the great ones of long ago, of the world teachers, of all those who have given of everything to serve the one God manifesting through their own internal life. And as the Christian doctrine says, who has seen the Son, Christ, has seen the Father. And in the same way we can say, those who have seen the body see the life in it. And if we make that life beautiful, then truly we see deity shining through all of the labors and works of the day. And it is better, it is easier, it is more to kindly, and we also will have more opportunity to grow and to have pleasure. There is nothing about religion that should frustrate. It is not the duty of to religion to say, Thou shalt not. It is rather the duty of religion to say, This thou shalt do. And maybe to make it just a little stronger, This thou shalt do regardless you're going to find that truth is going to be served regardless. And if we become servants of truth, we then become useful members of a universal society. Little by little, thinking about these matters, meditating upon them, trying to live them and understand them, we'll put a foundation on the book learning under all this creeds and crafts that we know and will help us to begin to appreciate that by power beyond ourselves we are universal citizens of eternity and regardless of all the differences arising the same power of infinite love and truth is in everything and each manifests according to its own life and when man is able to manifest it to a great degree he becomes a savior of life. And he becomes a being or person who will be honored forever by people who may not have any intentions of following his example. But that is, the, is irre irrelevant. We are going to follow these examples because we will never find peace until we are one with reality. But it isn't a quest beyond mountains or off to other planets or to the far distances of space. It is simply a quiet journey into the infinite universe of our own internal. And somewhere beyond the stars and galaxies inside of ourselves is that same great power that moves everything from the least to the greatest. And when we form a continuing partnership with, the, with that power to the best of our ability, we find that that ability increases and that little by little we attain to our universal citizenship in a creation that is forever good. That's it, folks.